be laying in bed at night trying to solve a problem. I got, I got a piece and I got to put it in, in a box. As you're developing these ideas, you also start thinking about how they will exist you know, in, the, in the real world. And all of a sudden, it's there. Fusion 360 came along and pretty much fallen in love with it. You don't need to be a surfacing whiz. It allows me the control that I need to get to the surfaces there in my head. It's combining engineering and design in a way that no one has ever done before. Josh, if engineering were a culinary delicacy, you would be a tower of Triscuits held together by a five-pound jalapeno-infused cream cheese yes. ball. Yes, thank you. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. Uh, that's the podcast. For engineers, designers, makers, bakers, and people who have made over 200 different sleek shot designs, I am Josh. And I am also Josh. Actually, I'm Adam. This week... Our very special guest is YouTube celebrity and man most likely uh -huh. to survive a zombie apocalypse, particularly sure. if equipped with rubber bands, Mr. Jurg Splava. <laughs> we'll start with a little background on slingshots, courtesy of SolidSmack.com. And then jump straight into the interview. I'm speaking of surviving the uh, zombie onslaught, yep. Adam, load the RV of ignorance with the vaccine of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? This episode of Engineer vs. Designer is brought to you by Autodesk Fusion 360, folks. Cat in the Cloud is real, and it is here. Get a free 90-day trial over at fusion360.autodesk.com. So we've done it before. We're doing it again. A tweet for this episode has gone out, and anyone who retweets that message will be entered into a drawing for a coded Engineer vs. Designer t-shirt. Spread that love, people. And as you know, today we're talking with a man that creates the world's deadliest rubber bands as a hobby. <laughs> it's Mr. Jörg Sprava. It's true. Before we get to their interview, though, let's go over a short history of the slingshot. Oh, my gosh. Do it. Now. Also referred to as a flip, a Shanghai, a bean shooter, a wrist <laughs> rocket, or a catapult. The slingshot is a small hand-powered projectile weapon that consists of a Y-shaped frame and elastic strips that launch a projectile as if you didn't know. A tad different than the leather cord versions. You swing around your head, as in that whole David Goliath thing. These type were first invented in the mid-1800s. Now, the earliest models were a bit of a DIY project that had already established a reputation for juveniles using them in vandalism. In the hands of a skilled user like Josh, however, slingshots were used uh -huh. as a hunting tool, firing metallic projectiles such as steel ball bearings, lead musket balls, and small animals. <laughs> <laughs> Some early... Some early designs even included an armrest mod to launch arrows. Arrows? Arrows. Arrows. <laughs> the first commercially made slingshots arrived in 1918 with the cast iron zip zip slingshot. Cast iron. Cast iron. That's a heavy slingshot. That is, that is messed up, dude. <laughs> However, it wasn't until the 1940s that slingshots saw a surge in popularity. It was during the 40s that the National Slingshot Association <laughs> was created. <laughs> really? One of the most powerful lobbying organizations in Washington, as it happens, aimed at yes. organizing slingshot <laughs> clubs and competitions nationwide. Yeah, despite the slingshots having that uh, reputation as being a back pocket tool for the Bart Simpsons and, you know, Dennis the Menaces of society, the NSA, who tracks this stuff regularly, mm -hmm. has reported they got they got <laughs> that over 80% of slingshot sales are for men over 30. <laughs> Where did this statistic come from? It's that is all not true. real. That it's is not, true. that is something, the NSA and, Googled and that. Now, and now Adam, since he Today, just turned 30, can now go out and buy himself a, a slingshot. <laughs> Today, slingshots are seeing a surge in popularity thanks to our special guest, Jurg, and his insane slingshot designs that have been popping up on YouTube all over the place. Up to date, Jurg has created a line of slingshots ranging from fully automatic <laughs> slingshot <laughs> miniguns to toilet brush firing slingshot. This is cool stuff. Yeah, not to mention the chainsaw slingshot, but we're going to talk about that later. Oh. And all while teaching us the physics of elastic and uh, why we need to be with him uh, during the end of all times scenario of your choosing. Yep. <laughs> so excited. Uh, let's do this now. Yeah, let's do it. Well, Jurg Sprave slash uh, Jurg uh, uh, 
Shprava, uh, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We have a conundrum for you to start with. If you could turn your left arm into a slingshot crossbow with an automatic hex nut loader, Ooh. but in order to do that, you had to wear hot pink Birkenstocks for the rest of your life, would you do that? <laughs> 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 Pink Birkenstocks. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, you've got you've, you've got the challenge. Do you do it? <laughs> okay, well, you know, pink. You know, well, if you can turn that and make it a chainsaw shooter, then we have a <laughs> okay. <laughs> then we have a deal. I think you could pull it off, man. Okay, you you're you're off. a well-known <laughs> internet celebrity by now, uh, having been in dozens of blogs and even uh, having your own slingshot channel on YouTube with over twenty-two thousand subscribers. Uh, just unbelievable stuff. Where did your crazed love for <laughs> slingshots come from? Well, when I discovered modern rubber, I mean, I had a slingshot as a kid, like most people have, but um, rubber that we used then was very poor. But when I discovered mm -hmm. modern rubber types, I realized that I, I can use it to convert my considerable, considerable strength <laughs> into speed. I'm a very strong, mm -hmm. but a very slow guy. You know, I'm, and with the rubber, rubber helps me converting that. And, um, you know, just with my body, I can shoot things at incredible speeds. And that's what fascinates me. Yeah, lots of different things too. We'll find out about. Uh, so you're, uh, uh, we're just super excited here about your contributions to the world of slingshots and highly destructive weaponry. But first, uh, we'd like to get a little background. Where did you grow up, and how did you uh, become so interested in slingshots? Well, I, obviously, I'm a German, and I grew up in Dortmund, <laughs> which is really like a coal miner town, but it's also Germany's biggest beer town. Oh. So most of the breweries are in uh, in Dortmund, uh -huh. and um, I grew up in the outskirts, pretty much in the uh, highest spot. It's uh, very much in the countryside, and um, that's where I grew up. And um, I lived there for a long, long time, and only moved here to Upper Franconia, which is really in northern Bavaria, uh, three years ago. Uh -huh. And see. why do I love slingshots, and how did I get you know so much um, into them? Well, it just got bigger and bigger. I started very small and, and just mm -hmm. to test out a little bit and um, and uploaded a few videos for people on a forum that I, I'd been in. Um, and uh, then I got so many additional views every time that I got addicted to it pretty much. Uh -huh. And I, I imagine you get a lot of comments or suggestions from uh, the, the people. You have over like 250 videos just on slingshots and variations. Uh, do the ideas come from users or do you think of them? Where does that start? Uh, all kinds. I mean, I have a list of, uh, of projects that I want to do someday. <laughs> so, uh -huh. and, and, but it's also, this is list, this is more like growing, right. it's never shrinking. I do get challenges from people and sometimes I just think it's ridiculous. And in the end, like a year later, I catch myself doing it, even if you know, <laughs> it was crazy in the, but, um, it's, um, it's also, um, you know, this slingshot hobby, and really for me, that's just a hobby. It's not my profession. That hobby is also a vent for my creativity, which really in my job, which is a manager job, there's not much room for creativity. But in my hobby, I need that. So Spreadsheets. <laughs> Spread spreadsheets to slingshots. Can, can, you, can you give us an example of uh, <laughs> where a user suggested something that you thought was completely insane, and then a year later you went ahead and did it? Yeah, the chainsaw <laughs> shooter, actually. Yeah, clearly, people, t you know, said, why don't you shoot chainsaws? And I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and then uh, just about a few months ago, I decided to make one, and it worked. Yeah. So. Very beautiful, too. <laughs> it was a surprise how well it worked. Oh, my gosh. Uh. Well, okay, so let's say you get, uh, somebody tells you they want to see a chainsaw shooter. And then do you just, like, wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, you know, like, Oh my gosh! I know how I'm going to do this. How do you how do you actually bring that idea from crazy idea into reality? What what what's the process like for you? Well, it's um, what I do is you know I have to work very hard during the week. Normally, I have like a fifty or a sixty hour week, uh, mm. very busy job mm -hmm. as a manager. But there's always little breaks, and uh, you know where you're waiting for people or when you're sitting through a very very boring phone conference <laughs> with like two million people in it and. <laughs> and half of them don't speak oh. any comprehensible language. So it's, <laughs> it's just, uh, I just keep thinking about it. 
And uh, once I decide to go ahead, then it gets, of course, it gets more detailed and then I will do little sketches and so on. But um, that's a, a part that I really enjoy because during the week I can't really hit the workshop and do it. But I can spend thing. I can spend time thinking about it, and that's how I usually work. And then when the weekend comes, it's usually all set. I mean, often only in my mind, and then there is no sketch and no blueprint. And sometimes, if it's more complicated, there will be some sketch. Mm. So, what about three uh, D modeling? Do you use any sort of software to help with final dimensions, or you know, making sure that a hex nut doesn't fly off into your eye? No, I mean, I have no engineering background. I have a master uh -huh. in business administration. And I never learned how to use these uh, these tools, and I also I'm not a very good uh, I'm not very good at technical drawings. So uh, the single PC tool that I'm using is uh, Paint <laughs> from my old Windows XP computer. Wow! So, uh -huh. not a very so okay, so so go back then. Let how do you go about creating? Are you just cutting wood and holding it up and seeing if it works, or are you making little drawings and dimensions? How how do you how do you manage these complex machines? Well, I do use a ruler and a pen when I do mechanics. We really complicate it. This, this, the smaller the weapon, the more uh, required is it mm -hmm. to have some sketches. On the big things, the tolerances are not that important, and then I can just go ahead and cut it out. So, like on the ashtray shooter, that didn't require much, uh, much uh, tolerancing. You just slapped on the, uh, the the pieces of wood together and put the rubber on. And yeah, I do sketch, do sketches, but in this case, I sketch directly to the wood, so I don't have to do that gotcha. on a piece of paper before. But it, on the very uh, small things like the pencil shooter and so on. Um, that's a different issue, and then you need some sketches. And sometimes I even cut uh, cut out shapes on from paper first, and see if the mechanics work. And and then if they do, I saw it, saw the parts out. Fantastic! T tell us about you. Describe your wood shop for us. What's uh, what's your shop like? Oh, very very crowded, completely untidy. My wife actually goes crazy every <laughs> time she. <laughs> it is a a, a car garage. That I converted into into my workshop, and there is a huge pile of uh, you know old projects you know that uh, that are put on there, and very you know very often when I try to retrieve one of the early ones, it's it's taking me hours <laughs> to just get it out. <laughs> and I do have um, consumer grade tools, so I have like a, a little belt saw and uh, a jigsaw, but it's none of that is professional grade. It's all. Stuff that you can buy in a hardware store for not much more than maybe a hundred. Yeah, that caught my eye. Oh. Actually, you know, you like to weaponize Black and Decker tools in particular. What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why the weaponization of Black and Decker tools? You know, I know that Black and, De and Decker doesn't have the best reputation in the market, there, and there is probably more expensive, better stuff. But I have to say, you know, the Black and Decker tools never failed me. You know, I, they are very inexpensive and they always work. I mean, I'm not, once did it did one of these tools let me down. So uh, I think they're just great. And, you know, guess what? They're not even paying me for saying that. So, yeah, they should, well, but they we'll don't. work on that. So, we'll see what, see if we can get you in touch with somebody over there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you have a favorite story maybe from when you were using any of your slingshots, like something happened you didn't quite expect? Imagine that could happen a lot. Well, the very first thing in one of my very early videos, I've been shooting a big steel ball against a motorcycle <laughs> helmet. You know, the, the ball came back with almost the same speed and missed Whoa. me by far and smashed it. It ricocheted the off the motorcycle. <laughs> that was uh, <laughs> unexpected, but I think it is in part responsible for the success of the video. People like to see fail, you know, fail videos. So. Uh, uh -huh. That it was very, but it, it was really dangerous. So I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and today I know better, but that was early days. Huh. So well, I mean, sh surely what you're doing is is pretty dangerous, right? I mean, surely dangerous things have happened uh, more than once. Do you, do you have any other examples of things that have, that we can learn from? <laughs> that we can learn not to do. Well, one thing that you definitely should never do is you should never uh, shoot slingshots without safety glasses. Hmm. It's very often the rubber will snap. Uh, it's not, you know, all rubber bands snap sooner or later. It's, so it's, it's not a question if, you know, are they going to snap? Or it's just when, you know. So, uh, so and that is not dangerous uh, for your skin. Uh, it was painful, though, but it's not very dangerous. But for your eye, it is very dangerous. And that happened to me once. So a, a snapping band hit me in the right eye and almost blinded me. And uh, to this day, it's not fully... 
recovered and it probably won't ever. So uh, it's a thing that you should never do. Always wear safety gloves. Very good. Uh, now, of uh, all your designs that you've made, uh, which do you, wh which would you say was the most challenging uh, to design? Well, you know, the, the pump action guns that I've been doing, I've been doing a few of those. But um, the, uh, the the smaller ones that really have the, like the same size as a firearm pump gun, those are very complicated because you know you have so many moving parts and everything from the timing needs to be just right. So uh, that was fairly complex, and it actually took me a while, like like two years, to uh, fine tune it to a point where I was, uh, you know, it was okay for me to publish a tutorial. Since the earlier models all worked somehow, but had too many issues, too many jams, and, and too many failures in between. So uh, mm -hmm. that was very complex to do. And then, of course, I did the big cannon, which uh, has a huge draw force and it's also very dangerous if something breaks. And that took me like I had to take a full week of a vacation to build that thing. So oh. um, <laughs> these are the two most complex the that designs. That is dedication. And when you release these uh, these designs for other people to build, are you ever concerned that, that someone is going to hurt themselves with one of these things? Yeah, it is an issue. I mean, I have to say that that's one of the reasons, maybe the most important reasons, uh, why I have decided to not mm. sell anything. Mm -hmm. So what I provide is I do free entertainment, right? And um, I, I provide that for everybody, free to see. But um, I don't I don't sell or give away like bands or nothing. I don't do that because of the danger. Why I think someone is able, if someone has enough experience and tools and skills to make one of these things, I believe that uh, should also be responsible enough to shoot with it without killing himself or others. So it's not the case that like a nine year old can can just uh, take the uh, jigsaw uh, <laughs> and make right, one of these. Right. So, yeah. With or without a tutorial, it's just not possible. So I don't think it's so bad. Uh, so um, if if there were a, a natural disaster or a zombie outbreak and you could take uh, only one of your slingshots or other uh, weapons with you, which one would it be and why? I think I'd take just a just normal conventional slingshot, one of the strong yeah. ones, that, of course, and enough rubber to uh, replace the bands every now and then. Uh -huh. Since this is just the uh, most compact and most versatile, very silent uh, uh -huh. and, and powerful slingshots that you can actually have. A More lot agile. Of the, uh, contraptions that I made, you know, they look very, very <laughs> cool, but they have no real <laughs> no. <laughs> I, just, I just make them for the video and, and they, I don't really use them. For It'd really them. slow you down yeah. when trying to get out of a sticky situation. But I mean, isn't that always true? That's always the case, though. You know, the most powerful tools of any kind are the ones that have been around for hundreds or thousands of years because they just work, you know? <laughs> definitely, definitely true in a lot of areas. So, so, you know, we talk a lot on this show about 3D printing and other forms of personal manufacturing have you ever 3D printed anything? I'm assuming not. Um, is there is there anything, does that interest you at all? It does. I think 3D printing is totally fascinating. And I contacted the guys at MakerBot, which is one of the, uh, I think, yep. more successful manufacturers of these things. I contacted them like a few months ago and asked them if they are willing to do a collaboration. Uh -huh. My suggestion was is that I would send them a slingshot and they would digitize it because that's something that I can't do. I, I don't have any skills right. and tools for it. And they would make, they would print a slingshot and I would then go ahead and um, and make a video about this so they could record some of the footage. Footage I thought that would be great, pro, you know, great promotion for them. And okay. uh, the guy who I contacted was very excited and he said he was a fan. But then I never heard back from them. I guess they probably have oh. decided <laughs> they have enough web. You know, with lower receiver business. Okay, and, and all right, Jörg. Uh, you yeah. are on the phone with the right... Pr I'm <laughs> sitting in the room. Right now next to me is a MakerBot Replicator 2, and I have the skills to digitize whatever parts you need. So let's, send let's it do a on collaboration. Over. We're going to make this deal on the show right now. You can send me anything you want to make, and, <laughs> and we'll get it over to you. Yeah. I'll do it. Send me your mail address, and I'll send you a <laughs> right back. So... Uh, Although I have to Here say, there's go. also some one additional thing is that uh, I have I often give designs to uh, small businesses that want to start uh -huh. selling slingshots. So I like made a design to them, and there is one guy who now wants to make a plastic mold, 
like a like a steel plastic mold to mass produce slingshots wow. that I designed. And I only okayed this under the condition that he would give me the uh, 3D design, uh -huh. I mean the file, so I can publish it for those that have a 3D printer. So they are not forced to buy it from him. So, yeah, because I don't want to commercialize my channel. I always want to have this kind of reputation that it's a, um, it's a thing that is non-profit. So, uh, therefore, uh, what I'm saying is that people will then be able to, uh, for free, to just get that design and print it out if they have a 3D printer. And if they don't, they can still buy it from him and it will probably end that up That is fantastic. Anyway. Now, so that, that was going to be one of my next questions. You don't make any money off of this, uh, even though you have such a huge viewer, uh, viewer base. That's, that's, I guess, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, respectable or something? It's, 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 it's surprising because you do have so many people watching these videos. Tell us, can you talk at all about that decision to, to be completely non-profit, non as you called it? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to say that I have a job that is, is pays me very well, uh, but it has a condition that I can't have a side income, since obviously wants to uh, wants me to use my free time for recreation and not for other jobs. So, um, and that's very common for if you like a CEO or something, then it's very common that these things are in your job mm -hmm. under here in Germany. I'm sure mm -hmm. if that's different in the US, it, it may be so. But um, and then also. Um, I have to say that I don't want uh, to commercialize my hobby because I'm afraid that I would then lose it. You know, then I would have taxes, I would have complaints by customers, I would have deadlines and all these things, lawyers looking into my business. So I don't really have a need for that. I have enough mm. of that in my job. So, uh, so as long as this is a hobby, you know, it's my decision if I want to make a project or not. And if I don't want to make one for three weeks, then I don't make one for three mm. weeks and uh, try that in your job. So, uh, so that's I think that's the main motivation. It's also the fact that on the internet, people don't like commercial projects. On the internet, people like amateurish things. They like dedication, commitment in, in people. And uh, every time I have uh, like a commercial touch in my videos, I lose a very significant amount of views. What do you mean? Like what kind of commercial oh, touch oh. loses views for you? For example, I did this project, the Witch Hunter project uh -huh. with the Paramount guys. Ah, so yes. it was like a promotion for the movie Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. And mm -hmm. um, so they sent me a whole team over from California, from, from Los Angeles, from Hollywood, obviously. And like 10 people, and they did a great job. I mean, great editing. It was a oh, great yeah. video. I love that video. <laughs> But, you know, the, the views are just very low. I mean, I just do a very simple video about something completely non-spectacular and I get more views than, than, than huh. these videos got. It smelled <laughs> like commercial business and people don't appreciate it. The blogs don't feature it. You know, they, they shun videos that are commercial. And uh, I think it's very, very hard these days to make a commercial video that mm -hmm. goes viral. People won't support it very much. Uh. Ah, good, good, good point. Uh, so there's just there there are thousands of EVD listeners around the world right now <laughs> going over to your channel and becoming very, very inspired. Uh, what advice uh, do you have for anybody who wants to go out to their shed after listening to this and build a highly destructive uh, slingshot? <laughs> but, but my first advice, I already said that always wear safety glasses. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's the thing. <laughs> Second thing is, by all means, if you manage to do something like that, come to my forum and show it to us. Because, you know, at my forum, we all love to look at uh, instruction <laughs> tools. <laughs> well, Jörg Schwabe, having you on the show today is even better than that time I spent an entire day shooting spitballs at Josh while he was passed out from too much vodka-infused turkey. Thank you <laughs> so much happened. for being on yep. the show with us today. <laughs> Almost, uh, my pleasure, guys. Lots of fun. Yeah, <laughs> thanks again. Okay. That, Josh, <laughs> was beyond amazing. That is absolutely fantastic. Whew. Having Jörg Sprava on the show was even more fun than being a human target for your fully automatic newt launching slingshot. <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. If you'd like to send us your favorite amphibian launching device blueprints, please address those to Josh. Cruelty to animals, sir. PETA, do not get in touch with us. If you'd like to send us blue <laughs> <laughs> blunt objects to survive hordes of the undead, 
who, by the way, were not harmed during the making of this episode. Please address those to Adam. Let us know what you think, who you want to see on the show, and what your favorite survival tool is at engineerversusdesigner.com or on the EVD YouTube and or Vimeo channel. Uh, and if you like to see us launch from a projectile device, uh, be sure to like us, plus one us, tweet us, or whatever else us as social media has been correlated to slamming face first into hard inanimate <laughs> objects. <laughs> this show was edited by the masterful Simon Martin. If you love our taste in music and need some more of that to help propel you through the work week, be sure to check out our new playlist once a week on Solid Smack Radio every Tuesday. Yep. Uh, we'll see you next week. And remember, without engineers, designers would be hurting themselves with multifaceted white ceramic slingshots. And without designers, engineers would never survive a zombie outbreak in style. But I would be the one with the iron-plated minivan, buddy. You know it. And I'm going to be looking good in that thing. <laughs> in the minivan? Yeah. <laughs> Inside. <laughs> <laughs> looking good during a zombie apocalypse? Check. Yes. Check. <laughs> Checkmate. A production of EBD Media.